Sam Giancana was the most flamboyant gangster of them all, when organized crime was at its most extravagant. I say he was far more powerful than Al Capone, and he was a giant. He had a beautiful showbiz girlfriend. He was pals with Frank Sinatra. Sam Giancana didn't like to keep a low profile. He liked the big life. He liked to be seen with the stars. He was worth millions and had the power of life or death. He killed a lot of people, had a lot of people killed. One cold stare from you and it could cause you to become very concerned. If you crossed them, you were in deep trouble. But in helping elect a clean young president and assisting in the CIA's murkiest operations, his career sees the mafia and politics mix into a deadly cocktail. The pursuit of Sam Giancana is the ultimate story of the state versus the mob. And the final chapter is one of the most notorious mafia hits of all. Sam Giancana had learned his gangster trade from Al Capone's top enforcers. He excelled as a driver, delivering killers to murder their victims and evade the cops. He learned how to lend money and collect the interest. Hey, Sam, loan me a five. I gotta go get something. He said, um, what do you take for security? And Sam said, how about a lie? His furious outbursts were so savage that people around him wondered about his mental stability. He was violent. But the people in the Chicago outfit almost are all violent. They kill people with the drop of a hat. He was a killer. Aged just 18, Giancana was charged with murder. But escaped conviction. When I first saw Sam Giancana, I thought, there is the arrogance, the hatred, the violence, the viciousness that I've dedicated my career to fighting. For the mob, Giancana's greatest strength was not his violent nature, but his gift for making money. It was Giancana who struck fear into the electrician's union so that every slot machine in Chicago paid the mob. It was Giancana who muscled the black gambling kings out of Chicago with threats and murder. Under his watchful eye, millions of dollars poured in from casinos in Las Vegas and Cuba. And by 1957, aged 49, Sam Mooney Giancana was boss of the Chicago outfit. Sam Giancana was the most powerful criminal chief in the history of the United States. He had his tentacles into the police, to the courts, to the, the business world around uh, Chicago. But just as Giancana reached the top, the government turned on organized crime. An eager young lawyer began fighting to see him and his kind fall. Robert Kennedy. The nation's underworld gets the unwelcome spotlight of publicity as the Senate's investigation subcommittee begins new hearings on crime. Arkansas Senator the Senate Labor Rackets Committee was investigating mafia corruption of the trade unions. Robert Kennedy, as chief legal counsel, made a name for himself by questioning witness after witness about their mob connections. Did you say that SOB, I'll break his back? Who did you make it about? I don't know. Then? I may have been discussing somebody in a figure of speech. Well, who did you make the statement? Whose back I were you going to break? I don't even remember it. Well, whose back were you going to break, Mr. Hoffa? Take of his speech, I don't even know who I was talking about, and I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, it was real-life drama, and, uh, and it was exciting to watch. On the 9th of June, 1959, 
The witness was Sam Giancana. Can you tell us uh, whether if uh, you have opposition from anybody that you dispose of them by having them stuffed in a trunk? Is that what you do, Mr. Giancana? Uh, would you tell us... Uh, Giancana refused to answer Kennedy's questions by taking what is known in America as the Fifth Amendment. When you take the Fifth, you say essentially, I respectfully decline to answer on the grounds that my answer might tend to incriminate me and nobody can touch you for it. Sam Giancana asserted his Fifth Amendment rights over 30 times. I declined to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to incriminate me. Chief Counsel Robert Kennedy seemed frustrated and goaded the gangster. Can you tell us anything about any of your operations? Or you just uh, like, giggle every time I ask you a question? The claim to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to incriminate me. I thought only little girls giggled, Mr. Gene Connor. <laughs> Bobby Kennedy's theatrics were perhaps intended to light Gene Connor's famously short fuse. I think he was hoping that Gene Connor would explode. But, you know, I never thought he really gave a damn. Round one in this long, bitter feud went to Sam Giancana. Kennedy could get nothing on him. And there was a reason why the Chicago boss felt untouchable. He was well connected to the Kennedys. Robert Kennedy's big brother, Senator John F. Kennedy, had set his sights on the White House. But just to become the Democrat presidential candidate was a battle. A Boston Irish Catholic couldn't get elected to anything in staunchly Protestant states of 60s America like Wisconsin and West Virginia. The wealthy Kennedy clan would have to buy support in these key primary elections, so they reached out to an influential family friend for help, Frank Sinatra. Sinatra was a friend of the, the Kennedy family, the family, and Jack Kennedy in, in particular. Frank, in his turn, had a friend and business partner who knew all about getting his way in politics. Sam Giancana. I have every reason to believe that there was mob money in, in the uh, West Virginia election. The person who handled the money was Frank Sinatra. Before voters went to the polls, Giancana sent one of his men to spread $50,000 around West Virginia. He sweetened local politicians with new office furniture and paid bar owners to keep Sinatra's campaign song, High Hopes, playing on jukeboxes across the state. Giancana's efforts seemed to help get the Kennedys over the first hurdle. John F. Kennedy became the Democrat candidate to run for president. But an even bigger challenge lay ahead. In November 1960, John Kennedy faced the sitting vice president, Richard Nixon, in the race for the White House. The election was too close to call. Pundits were saying that whoever won the state of Illinois would win the presidency. And the key to Illinois was Sam Giancana's backyard, Chicago. Giancana's Chicago outfit knew all about how to swing votes in their city. They'd been doing it for generations. In this city, no criminal enterprise is going to work until they've got the politicians in their pocket. He had the politicians. And I mean all of them. One ruse was to send scores of people from precinct to precinct, illegally voting in each one. Another well-worn trick was ghost voting, impersonating deceased residents of a precinct. Mob-controlled unions were prevailed upon to vote Kennedy to a man. 
There were even claims that Giancana's hoods intimidated voters at the polling stations. Listening to the radio, listening to the returns coming in, it was obvious that there was a theft underway. Not since 1916 had the presidential election result been so close. Kennedy beat Nixon by just one-tenth of one percent. Somewhat afternoon on the day after the election, Senator Kennedy received a telegram from the vice president congratulating him on his victory. With this in his Sam Giancana was quick to claim that it was he who had elected Kennedy to the White House. While most dispute this, Giancana certainly expected payback. Giancana can legitimately think that he had done his work and that he had tipped it and that he could expect some result. Giancana expected the new Kennedy administration to get Bobby off his back. He told an associate, Bobby will just be another goddamn lawyer soon. They promised me they'll take care of him. I am in my mind and convinced that there was a deal cut. That uh, if Giancana would get Illinois for the Democrats, that he would be given free hand. Giancana prophesied to the outfit a lessening of government harassment in Chicago and Las Vegas. He couldn't have been more mistaken. New President John F. Kennedy appointed his brother, Bobby, to the government post of Attorney General. I have felt that we should secure the best talent we could get for every position, regardless of uh, party, regardless of uh, any other factor. This test has been applied and has been applied in this case. Far from being just another lawyer, as Attorney General, the fanatical mob-chasing Robert Kennedy was now the country's top law enforcement officer. It was a shock for Giancana and the Chicago outfit. The last thing they thought was they would get Robert Kennedy as the Attorney General. Anybody but Robert Kennedy. That was a surprise. Bobby Kennedy, now in charge of the Department of Justice and the FBI, declared war on the Mafia. I think that uh, in the uh, field of organized crime, I think it's in a very serious situation that's facing the country at the present time. I think a lot of steps can be taken in order to deal with the problem. I think it's gotten much more serious over the period of the last 10 years. Giancana cursed at the sight of the Attorney General and fumed at the very mention of the Kennedy name. To him, Bobby Kennedy's war on organized crime was a betrayal. But as the Justice Department went to war, Sam Giancana fell in love. Phyllis McGuire was the lead singer of the headlining trio, the McGuire Sisters. She was 29. Giancana was 52. It seems violent Mo Giancana could be charming. And he wasn't flashy. It was just direct, and it was uh, strength, and uh, his eyes were, it's like they looked through you. She was a big star, stunningly beautiful, and he loved to be seen out with her on his arm. Giancana began to flood her with gifts of furs, cars, and jewelry. Cash had always bought him the most beautiful escorts, but this was different. He began to neglect business in Chicago, to follow Phyllis to performances all over the US. He even accompanied her on a two-week European tour. The tough mob boss had a chink in his armor, a weak spot the government would later use to help bring him down.
While Giancana was romancing Phyllis, Attorney General Bobby Kennedy was hard at work radically reforming the Department of Justice and the FBI. He was extremely driven. He absolutely hated what he called the outfit, the mafia, organized crime. To the 10 FBI agents assigned to Chicago, Kennedy added 60 more. Giancana called them G-men, or just the G. At first, he was unconcerned, dismissing them as Boy Scouts. Up to now, their track record against organized crime had not been good. But Kennedy was changing the game. The FBI agents that descended on Giancana were a new breed. They were all clean-cut, college-educated men. Many were lawyers. Above all, the biggest problem for Sam Giancana was that these government men had a fanatical commitment to their incorruptibility. Unlike other Chicago law enforcement, Giancana couldn't buy them. Robert Kennedy was also increasing the number of lawyers in the Justice Department's organized crime and racketeering section from 17 to 63. He rebuilt the whole operation. You can think of the Department of Justice as a, a aircraft carrier. And you can't turn an aircraft carrier on a dime. They don't have brakes. You can slow it down and steer it. He turned it on a dime and took it in a different direction. The Attorney General funded his new crack team of investigators well. His goal was to get all government agencies working together as never before, to break the grip of organized crime. He talked directly to you. It gave us a whole feeling of electricity in what we were doing and commitment to what we were doing. We did feel that we were kind of like the new untouchables. Giancana was now closely watched by the new FBI agents in Chicago. The view is fine and the kids are still in school. Over. His HQ was in the back of the Armory Lounge Bar and Restaurant in Chicago's Forest Park suburb. Despite FBI surveillance, his private business remained secret behind closed doors. Eyeball one to dugout. I read you loud and clear. Or so he thought. 10-3, eyeball one. Stay with it. The G-men had a new weapon that would turn Giancana's world upside down. Electronic surveillance. Uh, Bobby Kennedy decided that organized crime was an issue of national security. It was a threat to the United States and fell in that category that you could exercise a wiretap and install a wiretap without a warrant. The number of FBI bugs and wiretaps in America exploded from just a handful to hundreds. The FBI agents Roma and Hill assigned to monitor Giancana were quick to hide a microphone in the Holy of Holies, his HQ, the Armory Lounge. The G-men overheard Potsy Poe, an old associate, complaining about them to Mooney Giancana. I never thought it would be this fucking rough. You told me when they put his brother in there, we're going to some fireworks. Well, I never knew it would be like this. This is murder. Concentrate on a certain individual. You mean the outfit? Yeah. The agents heard exactly how Giancana ran the outfit. Although officially the boss, he received advice from senior mob figures and retired boss Tony Accardo. Listen, Mo, oh, we aren't here to try to twist your mind. We're just giving you what's practical. Practical advice, that's all. We're not here to try to destroy you. The tapes also revealed how Giancana advised his driver and bodyguard, Butch Blasi, about the Mafia Code of Silence, Omerta. He warned about the penalties for blabbing mob business to outsiders. There was a, a stuffed fish over the bar, and he points up to the stuffed fish. 
and says, You know how that fish got that way? He opened his mouth. And of course, he's saying this into a bug himself, but he's telling uh, Butch Blasey to, uh, to don't talk about all that kind of stuff. FBI agents Roma and Hill, in their surveillance of Giancana, did their utmost to exploit his weak spot, the relationship with Phyllis McGuire. They watched Sam and Phyllis closely, very closely. They took photos and shot moving footage of them together when they went out. With wiretaps and bugs, they also listened when they stayed in, even recording their conversation in their bedrooms, whether in Las Vegas or Maryland, Pittsburgh or Atlantic City. The pressure of tight surveillance got to Sam Giancana. His acid anger was fired at the G-men whenever he saw them. Now Roma, he spots us. He says, hello, Mo. And he walks away. So we move out of there, into the other room, and who the fuck walks in but that shit hill? Giancana started to lose control. He antagonized the agents and hissed obscenities. Retired boss Accardo was concerned that Giancana would do something stupid. Don't call them dirty words or anything. Don't pay attention. Just walk away from them. Let them talk. You guys, how and go fuck yourselves and this and that. The best, they're just like us. They got a job to do. We know what to do and we do it. I know. Bobby Kennedy was tightening the noose. But one government agency had jeopardized all his work by secretly seeking Giancana's help, the CIA. The consequences for the agency and for Giancana would eventually be dire. Giancana and many other gangsters had once had vast, lucrative business interests on the island of Cuba, just a short hop from Miami. In exotic and poverty-stricken Cuba, white tourists with green dollars could live like royalty and lose money in the comfort of the mob-owned casino hotels. Cuba was a gold mine for the mob. There's a lot of money made down there in the casinos and the joints and Castro took it away completely. On New Year's Day, 1959, Fidel Castro's rebel forces swept into Havana and with popular support, supplanted the old mob-friendly regime of President Batista. Castro swiftly nationalized land and American businesses. He cost the mob and the US government untold millions of dollars. The mob, they were running this Cuba. They were running amok down there under Batista. And when Castro came in, he threw them all out. So they were not happy with him. If they could get rid of Castro, they could move back in. It wasn't just the mob who wanted Castro gone. The CIA saw Castro as a dangerous communist on America's doorstep, and they wanted him swept away. So who would you go to? You go to mob guys who had good connections in Cuba, they would operated there for years, and are pretty good at killing people. On the basis that my enemy's enemy is my friend, the CIA met Giancana and associates to try to arrange a gangland hit on Cuba's president, Fidel Castro. They're certainly naive about the organized crime. They're not a hit squad. You can't buy them to kill people. They thought they could. At a clandestine meeting at the Fontainebleau Hotel in Miami, the CIA wanted a Capone-style attack 
with Castro going down in public in a hail of bullets. The real-life gangsters demurred, wanting to keep things nice and clean. Giancana suggested something much more CIA, using pills to poison Castro's food and drink. The CIA took his advice. But when a US government agency secretly commissioned murder from gangsters, they should have seen trouble coming. And once you've dealt with them, and they've given you something, then they have a right to ask for something back. And you don't want a reciprocal relationship with them. You're compromised. Master manipulator Giancana soon turned the situation to his advantage. First, he's working for the CIA. And then somehow, they find themselves working for him. Giancana suspected Phyllis McGuire of having an affair in Las Vegas with top showbiz comedian Dan Rowan. He talked his CIA contact into arranging to plant a microphone in Rowan's hotel room. But the operation went terribly wrong. The installation engineers were discovered by hotel staff and arrested by police. The CIA feared the mob connection and Castro assassination plot would get out. The agency did not want that plotting to come public. And they were afraid to death of any public examination of Giancana. To avoid a public trial, a deeply embarrassed CIA director of security, Sheffield Edwards, had to confess in a memo to the FBI the whole sordid affair. When he found out, the Attorney General Bobby Kennedy was furious. And he called Sheffield Edwards in to his offices. And what he said was, the next time you do something like that, you talk to me first. One day, all this would come back to haunt both the CIA and Sam Giancana. FBI agents Roma and Rutland, watching and being verbally abused by Giancana in Chicago, now put even more pressure on the beleaguered outfit boss. Determined to drive him over the edge, the agents implemented what they called lockstep surveillance. Every day, round the clock, they were with him, following in cars. When he got out, they got out. When he walked, they walked within feet of him. They followed him on his golf round, rushing his game, jeering from the edge of the greens. They were like this. He played golf, they were behind him, just everywhere he went. And it sent him off like a Roman candle. They even followed him into restaurants. If he went to the restroom, an agent would also go and stand at the next urinal, which made it difficult for him to do what he had gone there to do. It was pure, simple harassment. They weren't getting anything out of that. Roma and Rutland were right about one thing. It drove Giancana mad. An electronic surveillance recording made in June 1963 reveals that his mob associates thought he was becoming dangerously irrational. That fucking John Connor, wait till you hear what he's done now. He's now making good decisions. What happened? Charlie McCarthy told Roma that Mo told him to tell Kennedy to talk to him through Sinatra. For Christ's sake, that's a cardinal rule. You don't give up a legit guy. He tells Roma that Sinatra's that guy to Kennedy? More or less. I'm so fucking mad I could jump out your window. Who would that be something about? The genie is driving this man goofy. A maddened Giancana lashed out in a way the mob would never understand. He sued the FBI, 
saying their lockstep operation violated his civil rights. Giancana's lawyer hired a film crew to shoot the FBI lockstep in action. In a darkened courtroom, the judge was also shown Giancana's respectable lifestyle. Playing a round of golf, going to church, and visiting his father's grave. An injunction against lockstep surveillance was granted. The FBI agents would have to keep their distance. Sam Giancana had, for the moment, beaten the FBI. But Giancana's victory soon evaporated. And to escape the continual scrutiny, he and Phyllis holidayed at Sinatra's home in Palm Beach, and then in Las Vegas. Meanwhile, the FBI was recording some disturbing mobster conversations. Kennedy, a guy should take a knife and stab and kill that fucker. I mean it. This is true. Honest to God. Right in the White House. Who's that? Get it out, fucker. The Kennedys' war against organized crime was fueling a dark mood among gangsters all over the United States. They should kill the whole family. A mother and father, too. Just a few months later, on November the 22nd, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated during a Dallas motorcade. The killing spawned a rash of conspiracy theories about who might be responsible. There was always a strong rumor that the mob had something to do with the assassination of, of John Kennedy. The rumors of Mafia involvement were fed when it was revealed that the man who gunned down Kennedy's assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, was mob fixer Jack Ruby. It didn't go unnoticed that Sam Giancana had sought Ruby's help from time to time. But despite the rumors, there has never been anything to substantiate claims that the mob had any part in it. President Kennedy's death did, however, give the mob what it wanted, the immobilization of his gang-busting brother. I think he was simply crushed and shocked by it. An FBI informant heard Giancana's reaction. What he said was chilling. Attorney General Robert Kennedy will not have the power that he did. Within a year, the new president appointed a different attorney general, and Robert Kennedy was gone. Giancana thought the pressure was off. But Bobby Kennedy had rebuilt the Justice Department to smash organized crime. Even without him, the machinery worked on. Crucially, Kennedy had inspired a generation of investigative lawyers who would not give up the fight. One of Bobby's boys was a young lawyer in the Department of Justice Strike Force, David Shippers. Always there was this Sam Giancana hanging out there, the one guy that nobody seemed to be able to touch. All he had to do was surface once, and we'd be able to put him into a conspiracy of some kind. Couldn't find anything. Shipper's problem was a lack of hard evidence. The FBI agent's years of electronic surveillance put Giancana at the center of extortion illegal gambling and murder. But as the bugs were installed under presidential prerogative and not by a judicial warrant, the thousands of hours of incriminating recordings were not admissible as evidence in court. But determined to put Giancana behind bars, 
shippers meticulously constructed a cunning legal snare. First, to question Giancana about his criminal career, shippers awoke the dormant power of an investigative grand jury. Without the grand jury, we were dead in the water. We couldn't do a thing because we had no personal subpoena power. It was a grand jury that had the subpoena power. If you're subpoenaed to the grand jury, you got no choice. You got to show up. You may take the Fifth Amendment, but you're going to you're going to get dragged in there. Second, shippers had to stop Giancana hiding behind the Fifth Amendment by removing any possibility that he could incriminate himself. If what you're saying can never be used against you, then the Fifth Amendment doesn't apply. That's where the use of immunity came in. Granting immunity from prosecution to a top mafia boss was a bold step and a hard sell to Shipper's boss, the U.S. attorney. The U.S. attorney looked at me and he said, are you nuts? Are you crazy? They said, well, you don't really think he would talk. We wouldn't immunize him if we didn't think he'd talk. If he doesn't talk, we'll put him in jail. If he does talk, we're going to have one heck of a great case. We'll break the whole stupid mafia. At last, the trap was set. But would Giancana take the bait? In December 1964, the federal grand jury investigation began. To soften Giancana up, shippers summoned his mob associates to question them in secret. Giancana feared they might be spilling their guts, but he couldn't be sure. Then, to play even more on Giancana's increasing paranoia, Shippers exploited his weak spot. He subpoenaed Phyllis McGuire. So here comes Phyllis McGuire. We're going to put her in the grand jury. I just assumed she's going to come in and answer our questions. And the questions were essentially, would essentially have been about her association, nothing embarrassing. She was the key to this whole thing. Phyllis seemed shaken by the experience. Whether she actually testified or asserted her Fifth Amendment rights and declined to answer is still secret. But the thought that Phyllis had told them anything sent the paranoid Giancana crazy. You know, he said over the weekend that he was pretty angry with you. Have you talked to him about it? No comment. Well, the word came back to us that Sam Giancana was ready to kill himself. Is this an indication, do you think, that your relationship is all over? No comment. Because he thought, if she talked, I'm in trouble. David Shippers scheduled Giancana straight after Phyllis and made sure he reinforced Sam's fears when they met just before questioning. I had a, a transcript of another individual's testimony in some case. It was about a half inch thick. And we had the uh, court reporter put a page on top that said, testimony of Phyllis McGuire. And I know Sam saw it. Shippers had Giancana right where he wanted him, on the witness stand. The Chicago boss thought he knew the rules of this game. He'd plead the Fifth Amendment to each question and go home as usual. But he didn't realize David Shippers had changed the rules. I remember the judge saying to him, Mr. Giancana, if you received a traffic ticket on the way in here today, nobody can touch you. You are immune from any prosecution for any crime as of this moment. Immunity effectively stripped Giancana of Fifth Amendment protection. And then it really hit him when the judge told him he was immune and he had to talk. He was ordered to testify. Then it hit him. The single-minded purpose of David Shippers seemed to remind Giancana of an old adversary. He turned to me and he said, you're one of Bobby's boys, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir, I am. Giancana had no choice. If he talked and lied, he was certain to perjure himself. If he talked and told the truth, 
the mob would kill him. Giancana gave his name and address, invoked the fifth, and the trap was sprung. Sam Giancana, boss of the Chicago outfit, by refusing to answer questions, was in contempt of court and taken straight to jail. Sam Giancana was totally awed. He was rattled. He couldn't understand how this could happen. The judge commented that Giancana had the key to his own cell. He would be released when he decided to answer the grand jury's questions. But in the outfit, you don't talk. Giancana kept his mouth shut. This was a government victory of sorts, as it was the first time he'd been in prison for over 20 years. That rocked the whole organized crime around the country. But was it such a great victory? Giancana could only be held in jail until the grand jury folded a year later. On the night Giancana was released, in May 1966, there was a party at his home in Oak Park. But senior mobsters found nothing to celebrate. The outfit old guard decided Mo Giancana's high profile and volatile temper was bad for business. They gave the FBI a belated victory by stripping Sam Giancana of his rank as boss and throwing him out of Chicago for good. Giancana left the US to live in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Over the years, he built a new life for himself. No G-men dogged his steps or monitored his phone calls. And Giancana returned to what he did best, making money. In the mid-60s, as NASA prepared to put a man on the moon, Giancana was launching a gambling operation on cruise ships in the Caribbean. While the US tore itself apart over the Vietnam War, Giancana's international ambitions met with success in Guatemala and with the Shah of Iran. In 1968, his old adversary, Robert Kennedy, ran for president. But on the campaign trail, he was gunned down and killed. And although the 70s saw an aging Giancana undergo abdominal surgery, he enjoyed a quiet, wealthy life. Then, suddenly, a dark episode from his past cast a chill shadow over Sam Giancana, his connection to the CIA. In January 1975, a Senate Select Committee began investigating illegal CIA operations, specifically CIA involvement in plans to assassinate Castro. Its findings would shock Chairman Senator Church. It is simply intolerable that any agency of the government of the United States may engage in uh, murder. The committee was very interested in hearing from any mobsters consulted by the CIA in their Castro assassination plots. Although lying low in Mexico, Giancana had been snatched from his hideaway and suddenly found himself deported back into the United States. The press were waiting. Mr. Cano, why did you have to leave Mexico, sir? Why? I don't know. Mr. Jim Cano, what are your future plans? 
the future plans of one-time boss Giancana were to re-establish his cut of Chicago outfit operations. Once he arrived in Chicago, he announced to the to the entire organization that he was back and he was the man. But a new generation ran the Chicago outfit. They had no room for the aging Giancana. By that time, a lot of his rivals were in the penitentiary or dead because of what we'd been doing to them. Knocked out of action in Chicago, Giancana received a subpoena that ordered him to appear before the Senate committee without fail in Washington, D.C. on June the 24th, 1975. But Sam Giancana never made it. On June the 19th, 1975, Four days after celebrating his 67th birthday, Sam Giancana was at home in Oak Park, Chicago. He was cooking in his basement kitchen. Routine police patrols noticed nothing unusual. Health problems meant he could not eat spicy foods. So it seems the sausage and peppers was a late night snack for a friend. A friend Giancana liked and trusted. A close friend. The Mafia hadn't quite finished with Sam Giancana. The way he was killed showed that the mob no longer trusted him to keep quiet. He was shot in the mouth so that you might draw the conclusion that somebody was leaving a message. Don't talk. It was somewhat interesting that, that somebody that powerful uh, was, was killed, so there had to be a major, major decision among uh, the, uh, the, the powers to be in the mob. Sam Giancana's extraordinary career had lasted over 50 years, spanning the heyday of organized crime in America. In the years after Giancana, show business stars began to shun any mob connection. The glamorous image of gangsters became tarnished. People realized they were just killers. Never again would a mafia boss be so closely associated with the bright stars of show business or the dark underbelly of politics. The FBI and the Justice Department had struck the first serious blows aimed at breaking the Mafia. 